It was a lot of heavy lifting in the beginnings because the mobile home parks are really mom and pop. So they don't use the property management software that's available right now. So I did some double escrows to kind of get my feet wet. And then I actually bought one. So that's how I got into parks. I would say a lot of homework. Here's a homework before I bought one. Do you love your job, but want other investment options than your company's 401k and trying to pick stocks? If so, you've come to the right place. In this podcast, you will get actionable information for your passive real estate investment journey. Welcome back to another episode of Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. Here's your host, Justin Dixon. All right, Walter, welcome to the podcast. Happy to have you on. Thank you. I appreciate it. I absolutely do. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no worries. Why don't we jump right in, maybe share with the audience kind of who you are, where you are, and what you're up to. Sure. I'm Walter Johnson. I'm a founder of Sonos Capital. And we buy mobile home parks to probably 13 states, including Arizona. So we're in uh, our offices in Arizona and I love the state and I love what I do. Awesome. And how long have you been in the kind of real estate game? Uh, I've been in real estate since 2002. Actually, I bought my first property, investment property, single family home in 2002 when I was just turned 23 at the time. Got it. So you started with single family as your first investment property. Kind of why start there? That's the only thing that I knew. And I think it was at the time, and I would say looking back, it was the lowest barrier of entry. Yep. If I had to do it all over again, I would probably save my lunch money and bought multifamily, but that's what I knew. And I got an opportunity to actually buy a single family house, investment house, brand new in a up and coming city called Avondale here in Arizona. And so I just gravitated. It was cheap to actually get in. I think it was like $1,500 down. Wow. You gotta wherever your spot and then you wait eight, nine months for the house to get built. Yeah, that's super interesting. How long did you rent that out and what were the economics on that first deal? Just kind of high level. Yeah. So the economics on that deal was, I think the mortgage was $740 a month, right? Okay. And I was renting out for, I think, $1,150. 11, yeah, like 1175 or something like that. It seems like a lot of money, but a single family homes is actually not. You're only getting that 400 bucks or so or $400 a month. But what that was is that when you actually had expenses and actually the tenant stayed for about two and a half years, so it wasn't bad. They were actually yeah. good that paid. However, you do have expenses, so it ate up the cash flow. That's the reason why I gear towards multifamily and bubble home parks. So yeah, I, you can spread your expenses and all that across a number of units as opposed to just one, right? Like that's right. the economies of scale that happen when you get into multi-tenant properties. How did you kind of go from, well, I guess... Have you always been in single family? Have you been in any other kind of parts of the real estate business or have you always been more of a on the, on the investor side? Um, on the investor side, but in single family homes in my mid 20s and early 30s, that's actually when I started buying. I bought a single family home, then I bought my place, my primary residence, and then I actually started getting into apartment buildings. But majority of was my single family homes. I was actually buying them from a wholesaler. He was a neighbor of mine. And so I got in at good prices, but the economics were still the same. It's hard to scale 30 single family homes. Yeah, typically the property management is the big either time suck or cost suck that kind of comes into into play, right? Like if you have 30 units that are all clustered in one building, it's more easy to manage and deal with tenants and maintenance requests and all that fun stuff. But when you've got 30 even spread across a town or a city, that can be a big challenge. How did you overcome that for anybody that's kind of listening that has one or two single family houses in their local region? And they're thinking of trying to scale and maybe running into the same problem. I uh, would sell everything you can if you can and actually get it to multifamily. <laughs> <laughs> so get out now and pivot into something that's more scalable. Right, 100%. And the reason being is also is that when you're actually multifamily, if you raise the rent, let's say 50 bucks or 100 bucks because you actually renovated the units, et cetera. Well, not only do you generate more cash flow, but you generate more appreciation and therefore more wealth in your portfolio. With single right. family homes, it's really difficult to actually do that. You can't, you, I wouldn't say you can't, but it's difficult because the value is not based on the actual rent. It's based on comps and what their neighbors actually sold their house for or bought it for. Yeah. We started our journey in buying a duplex. I didn't want to go into single family from the signal standpoint of like, one unit, one tenant, if they leave, I'm on the hook for the entire mortgage, at least with two. If one of them's there, at least I'm getting some cash flow or at least breaking even. But I'm realizing that we bought a bit of an older property. And when you need to put on a new roof because it's leaking, not because of a storm or like something you can run through insurance, that just destroys your cash flow for a year, right? Like it just kind of wrecks you. So 
So that's why it was doing pretty well. And now it's like, well, okay, this year is pretty much gone for that from a cash flow perspective, because the new roof was a couple thousand bucks, and that just ruins the whole thing. So and how did you manage your single family portfolio? Because obviously, you had a bunch. And so how were you doing it? Were you doing all yourself? Or how did that work? You know, I actually had a property management from the beginning since I actually owned single family rentals. But you still have to actually deal with single family rental property management. And if something goes wrong, you actually have to pay because you don't want them to actually just have a no limit on your checkbook or like your credit card or something like that. And when you say, hey, can you actually fix this? Or I give you permission to actually repair this on my behalf if it's a pool pump. I mean, that can get pretty pricey. If it's actually fixing a pool before it's becoming a rental, that's actually pretty pricey as well. So I would just stay clear of single family homes and also pools as well. Yeah. Well, and then also adds liability into the mix, having a pool and all that fun stuff. So yeah. I, you have dates. It keeps you up at night because tenants have kids and you just don't want to have any accidents. So I stay yeah. with that. Yeah. So pivoting into kind of your mobile home parks and Sonus Capital, and, and obviously, how did you fare going back to your single family for two seconds? You started in 02. Were you buying through kind of the 08 crash or how did you fare during all of that? No, no, actually, I wasn't buying. Actually, I bought a place in Denver, Colorado and kind of stayed there. And then I got back to Arizona probably 2010, 2012, right when we were coming out of the recession. Yeah, you know, yeah. Of, the, of that. And that's actually when I started learning about mobile home parks. That's when I really started studying. I'd seen one online and it was a wholesaler that I knew. I was looking at fourplexes because the fourplexes here, I mean, in the height of things, they were $600,000, but in the recession, you could have got them for $60,000. So wow. I want to look at things, right? And see what's going on. And I seen yeah. it and it was grossing about $45,000 a month. And I was like, oh my goodness. And it wasn't that big. It wasn't like 200 spaces or anything like that. And I was like, I got to look at this. That's a, like a lot of cash. And so that's when I started studying mobile home park. So that was 2000, let's say 12, 13. I studied them for three years and then I started talking to sellers and calling people. And that's actually the beauty of technology right now. You can actually just call someone, and just pick their brain about what they own and they'll give you some information. And then you can actually learn by talking to owners versus yeah. when I started. That's hard to do because we had newspapers. Yeah, no, you were kind of doing the snail mail and really kind of have to sift through the newspaper to kind of find your leads and all that stuff. Before we dig too much into mobile home parks, I want to unpack this a little bit because it is an asset class that is interesting. I've talked to a few mobile home park investors and I do mostly multifamily. And so mm -hmm. there's obviously pluses to mobile home park. So before we jump into that, I want to take a quick sponsor break. So we will be right back. Whether you're in a job you love or hate, building a financial foundation is important. This foundation can support you by providing passive income, stability in an uncertain economy, or the launching pad for you to start your own business. Great Venture Capital helps busy professionals invest in commercial real estate to build passive income streams, grow wealth, and take advantage of tax benefits. If you'd like to learn more, check us out at greatventurecapital.com or send an email to justin at greatventurecapital.com. All right, we are back on the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast with Walter Johnson. So we started out kind of talking about your single family journey and kind of your entry point into real estate investing, which candidly, that's how a lot of people get into it. Because like you said, it is something you know, it's a low barrier to entry, but can be cumbersome and challenging if you don't have the processes and systems and all that fun stuff set up. And then you pivoted into multifamily. So let's go back to like 20. 15, kind of when after you were done, kind of with your education and really understanding what mobile home parks are and how they operate in the economics, because there's a few different options, I guess, within mobile home parks. So talk us through kind of how you started to underwrite these bigger deals and evaluate how they provide you with cash flow and how to operate them. Sure. So how I transitioned, actually, I reached out to owners that had mobile home parks. And they just said, hey, come by and actually take a look at my books because a lot of them, they're just pen and paper. And so I would drive to the park, drive to the house, look at it. It was a lot of, I would say, a lot of heavy lifting in the beginnings because mobile home parks, and they still are like that, but the mobile home parks are really mom and pop. So they don't use the property management software that's available right now. So I've seen a lot of parks and I did some double escrows to kind of get my feet wet. And then I actually bought one, double escrow one in 2017 and then bought it back in 2018. So that's how I got into parks. I would say a lot of homework. Here's a homework before I bought one. Yeah. So let's talk about that first deal. Like how big was it? Where was it? And what were some of the economic factors that kind of went into that deal? 
Yeah. So that's funny that you mentioned that. I actually had just seen it. So it got sold twice already. Okay. It's for sale right now for I think like four and a half million or something like that. But <laughs> right. So every time I seen it go up for sale, went up for sale for like a million more than I bought it for. Yeah. Like every it. year and a half or two years or something like that. It's really great. <laughs> so how I bought that, Jim and Carol, he had health problems, Alzheimer's. So they were actually looking to sell. They actually had a balloon due from Wells Fargo that okay. they're doing like 30 days. So this is actually a really, really urgent deal to actually happen. And so Carol was trying, she was trying to manage all the books and whatnot, and, and she did the best she could. And I got it. And we have this huge park, it was 155 space park. And I think the numbers that they show was like eight, 10, $11,000 a month. Like it wasn't grossing anything. And it was $18,000 in back rent. It was really the textbook of a mismanaged park. Yeah. So we came in, bought it. It was actually an easy process to actually buy it in 30 days. Jim passed away the 30 days after we closed. I mean, it was that type of, yeah, that type of scenario. So we turned that park around. I bought it. No, no, I think I, I bought it. I turned it around. And then I, at the height of it, I was making probably half a million dollars a year off that park. Wow. Yeah. So I was like, okay. To me, that's actually retirement money. So we can have one park, half a million dollars, and it's operating. Yeah. If, and I was like, okay, well, I'm actually going to sell this because what I want to do is I want to buy 10 of these. And so, yeah, yeah. Right. And so that's how Sonos Capital 2 actually got formed. Because so I was like, I just want to create a fund and actually go buy 10 of these. And so that's kind of how it all worked out from beginning to end, I would say. Yeah. And so how did you buy that first one? Was it just you? Did you like there was, have investors or how did that work? Yeah, it was me, uh, seller financing. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yep. For those of the, the listening don't know what seller financing is, explain it. It sounds like they were in a very unique scenario and you probably were rescuing them so they didn't have to deal with the health issues plus the park and all of that fun stuff. So what is seller financing? How did it work in this scenario? So how did it work? So seller financing is when the actual owners of the park or owners of the property actually act like the bank. So usually you give them a down payment, could be zero to 30% usually, and you create terms, whatever that looks like. This one in particular was 10% down because they needed the cash for medical bills. Yep. And then there's a 10 year term. And I think I did it at 6%. Yeah, 6%. And then I actually refinanced later to like 4% interest only. Imagine that you can actually refinance with a seller and finance you. So, yeah. so you refinance with the seller. You said, Hey, let's renegotiate. Yeah, absolutely. You can do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fascinating. I've never heard of anybody refinance with a seller and essentially they were taking less. So then you renegotiated a better deal for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Got it. Super fascinating. So from a seller financing perspective, obviously the benefit is there are no really like hard and fast rules and regulations, right? Like you can negotiate whatever the down payment is. You can negotiate whatever the interest rate is, which essentially is, is their cash flow, right? They're essentially taking, owning the note as a bank perspective and you're paying them interest and that's the passive income for them, right? And then you're operating the deal, you're the owner and, and obviously ownership transfers over to you. But that's super fascinating that you actually did a refi with an owner. That's interesting. Congratulations, that's super creative for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So it worked out. Of course, she wanted the actual passive income. Now she's a widow and yeah. needed cash as well. So yes, absolutely. I've seen a lot of people across mobile home parks and just the mom and pop story is they don't want to continue to operate these things. They're older, they want to retire, but they don't really want the lump sum, right? So if they sold it, they don't want to have that massive tax burden and just having a bunch of cash. They'd almost rather spread that out over five, six, seven, ten 10 years with doing seller financing, it massively benefits them. So you had that deal, you sold it, even though you're making tons of money and Sonos Capital was born. So let's talk about Sonos Capital. What's your focus? Where's your focus? You mentioned in the beginning, you're across like 13 states, including Arizona. So let's talk about kind of the scale that you were able to achieve taking that one mobile home park and flipping it into a bunch more. Yes, yes. Before I answer that question, let me kind of pivot back up a little bit. The reason why I actually sold that, even if it was making, I think it was like 476,000 a year or something. I think those numbers to be exact. And the reason being, because I actually wanted to go full cycle to actually have the experience of selling yeah. So when you actually create a fund and you attract investors and you're raising capital, they actually want to say, hey, Walter, what have you done? Have you yep. And so it gives 
they actually experience in that realm. You're building your track record, which is very important in this world. hundred percent. Yeah. So I did it with fourplexes, duplexes, single families. So it's just a different ball game. So what we actually do is that we are in 13 states. Usually they're red states, I would say, landlord friendly. Yep. We stay away from, let's say, the Californias, the Washingtons, the Oregon, yep. et cetera. And we just apply the same business model that we actually done here in Arizona. So there's actually a park that we're looking at, 627 spaces, and he wants 24 million in that seller financing as well. I mean, just imagine that. Wow. And yeah, he's owned it for 30 or 40 years. So those are the things we actually look for. So deals are still out there, no matter what we look at on the internet. There's yeah. deals out there. There's another deal we're looking at here in Tucson, 480 spaces. So that won't be seller financing, but it will be a deal. Yeah. Yeah. And how are you finding these deals? Because obviously, private equity firms are joining the fray when it comes to getting into mobile home parks. Obviously, they don't want 150 units. They want a portfolio of 1,000 units across multiple parks right? that are just operational and cash flowing and all that stuff. So how are you actually finding deals, especially a 624 unit? That's impressive. Direct to sellers, marketing to sellers. Got it. Uh, so what I've done in the past, and actually I did this with apartment buildings and duplexes. And this is funny that you mentioned that you're in duplex. I actually, I bought a duplex one time in Tucson. I kid you not. Like it was, the payment was 400 bucks a month. It rented out each side for 650. Wow. And I kid you not. And I did mailers. She was the first one to call me. She called me on a Thursday. I seen it and bought it on a Saturday. And I kid you not. So I'm walking through and taking photos. And her name was Janet. And I'm sitting in her living room, I'm like, Janet, how much do you want for this? I mean, I, one of the other units was, there's a family lived in it, but it was like 12 people in this duplex and the backyard was kind of trash. Yeah. How much do you want for this? And, and I was like, I want to keep the mortgage in place, right? She's like, yeah, I think it was worth 130 and she owed 111. Right? Okay. And I was like, so how much you want? She's like, she hesitated too. She's like, well, you give me 500 bucks? And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> 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 then so I took it over, right? And I was like, yeah, I'll give it to you in like 30 days at the closing table. She's like, okay, that's great. And that's how it worked. She wanted you to take over the mortgage. So take that $11,000 burden off of her plate and just give her 500 bucks to say thank you. She moved to uh, Idaho to be with her brother because her, her Janet's husband passed and she was lonely. So she wanted to go to Idaho. That's fascinating. Yeah. You so some so, interesting stories. <laughs> yeah, I know, 100% I do. Yeah. That's probably another podcast. But what I'm trying to say is that when you actually market to sellers, and owners, you get these stories and when you meet them and you're face to face, you can actually, deals are, I don't want to say deals are had, they're actually made. And so that's yeah. what we actually buy directly from sellers and owners. One thing that kind of gets lost in this game of, or just commercial real estate or even real estate investing in general is the term slumlord kind of comes out and like, oh, you're a landlord, you're like gouging your tenants and all this stuff. And then you think about just that story right there where you're like, she was in a tough situation. She owed some money on a property, right? And you were there to help her out. Like That's the other thing that investors do is they help operators of properties, whether it's a single family house or a 624 unit mobile home park, get out mm -hmm. of that deal and move in to do something else, right? Because sometimes it's like you're just latched to that property and you can't do anything. And then you come along and you pay somebody 500 bucks for a duplex and they're happy. And that's all that matters is you're happy, they're happy. They can go move on with their life and the rest is history. So I think it's awesome. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we got one that we're buying as well, seller financing, and he actually had some health issues as well. So he mm. 80 something years old, he failed, he broke his collarbone, he was in the hospital for months, he got infected, he had to have surgery. I mean, when you actually have these scenarios, you're not taking advantage, you're actually providing a solution to that owner, to the seller. Right. And here's the general rule I'd like to tell your audience is that you look at the tax returns and you see actually how much they're actually making, how much they're bringing home, not how much the park is generating, how much they're bringing home. So for example, he's making, it's grossing, I think like three hundred forty, three hundred fifty thousand dollars $350,000 a year. And he's pulling $70,000 a year. That's his kind of his salary. So what we're going to do is just give him a chunk of change and do the seller financing. It's going to be above $70,000 a year, but he'll get a chunk of change and he'll keep his income as though he owned the park. Right. And so we're, you're actually helping people and we really have to think and take this consideration that people are actually tired. They're tired of running the park. They're tired of tenants and we're providing a solution just like yeah. you are. Yeah, no, I think it's amazing. The seller financing thing, it's super fascinating because it solves a problem. And just like that person, they're making 70 grand. You can still keep them making at least 70 grand from the note payment and right. they don't have the liability and the hassle of operating and owning the park that's on you. 
and you're on the hook for the note. So it's the same thing. Like it's a win-win across the board. When you take over these parks or go after these parks, there's a, what is it called? Either own the land or you own the land plus you have actual rental properties, right? The, some of the actual mobile homes are owner owned, I guess, or property owned park, kind of thing. Park owned. Yeah. 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 Do you have a preference on just owning the land versus having to deal with the actual operation of a unit or units on that property? Yes. Yeah, so you actually don't make money if it's park owned homes. What the expense is and somebody that actually put in do the repairs, you're actually not making money off that. So let's just say you're like, yeah, I make $800 a month with the space rent and the home, but the expenses are just, they wash that away. So usually what we do is depending on the condition, we actually give them away or we sell them. There was one that we actually own and they moved out of town. I think it was like New Mexico. So it was vacant. So somebody actually came, a young person, like a young, he's right, like mid twenties or something like that. And they reached out to the manager and the manager called me and she's like, Hey, there's someone that actually wants to buy this home from us. I was like, okay, cool. How much do you think it's worth? And I was like, yeah, it's probably worth 10 grand. I was like, all right, we'll give a deal. We'll just give it to him for nine grand. Literally the next day, he actually came to us with $9,000 cash. <laughs> right. Right. And you just would never know it. So we own, I think it was like 11, no, it was more than that. It was probably like 13 homes on our insurance and our insurance was like $17,000 a year. Commercial insurance was a little bit different than single family homes. Mm -hmm. And once we actually got rid of our homes, it went from our majority of, it went from 17,000 to like $6,800 a year. Wow. Yeah. Just because so, you're not dealing with the tenants, right? You don't have the liability of the actual structures. If you're just owning the dirt, your maintenance is really utilities and electrical and like the the roads that people drive on to get around the park, right? Yeah. In the, in the grass. Yeah. And paying your manager the salary. That's right. It. Right. And Got you do it. have some expenses, but they're negligible after that. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah, because I've heard some people like having park owned properties because you can charge more. But to your point, like sometimes the expenses, especially if it's like an older unit, the expenses are going to outweigh the benefit there. At this point, we're recording this in kind of late March 24. How many parks have you gone full cycle on? Three. Three. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And we're, how many do you have now? Yeah, like how many parks? Yeah, we're looking at six. And the reason why I got into it, and I'll explain. I got into it when I bought it 2017, 2018, and then COVID actually happened. So that mm -hmm. was, I think that was a delay in everyone's life, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 But it was actually a great time after that. But who knew at the time? Right. Yeah. So currently we're actually looking at six to buy right now. Yeah. Got it. So your outlook, if we think about kind of the crystal ball, what's happening, your outlook is still in acquisition mode. And I guess for you, the interest rate, problem that a lot of the mobile or multifamily variable rate debt value add guys are dealing with right now doesn't really apply because you you're doing seller financing, especially on the seller financing deals, right? It doesn't really matter because you're just negotiating directly with the owner of the property and or the seller. And I'm assuming all of your stuff is fixed rate. So you're not like variable with the market. That would be very cumbersome, I would imagine. True. Yes, that's absolutely correct. What happens is that you'll see a park and it's online or something, or you get it from a broker and it's like a five or six or seven cap. But the interest rate is like a 6%. If you go to the bank, it's six or 7% interest rate. So yeah. it doesn't make any money. So you actually want to make a spread between the cap rate that you're buying it and the actual interest rate that you negotiate or you have with the bank. And that's actually how you get cash flow. So example, for the one we actually have an escrow is 10% cap rate, but the interest rate is 6% interest only. So what that actually is, just help we do the down payment, which is half a million bucks, where cash on cash is 37% rate of return. So you're able to do that. And so I wouldn't say, I wouldn't necessarily say interest rates don't matter, but interest rates actually don't play as much as a part like in apartment buildings. Yeah. And I guess my kind of comment on that was more around the variability of the rate. If you're getting into like a bridge debt, you're locking in a fixed rate, especially if you're doing like seller financing and all of that. Yeah, there's no variable. No, not at all. I like it because apartment buildings or anything else, you're looking at variable terms, three to five years, amortizing yeah. 25 years. I like what we do. Yeah. Yeah. And so what are the other states that you're really like, these are really interesting right now that you're kind of targeting? Colorado is actually a really good state. Arizona is a fantastic state. Believe it or not, you have Alabama. That's actually in the top eight as far as growth for mobile home parks. You have yeah. Texas, Florida is a really hot state. I'm not in Florida. It's too far. There's actually so many deals between Arizona and Florida. I really concentrate on those. Uh, well, the insurance in Florida, I mean, if you actually own the units, insurance in Florida has gone through the roof. 
Yes, yes, absolutely. And in California as well. I think State Farm just cut away like 12,000 or something like that, or something 120,000 homeowners read last week. Yeah. So just looking at these other states, I would say head east if you're in Arizona. Yeah, got it. Got it. And then I guess, so you're still in acquisition mode for kind of what you're looking at. And how do you bring other people into the deal? Are you doing it solely with your own funds or have you raised a fund or how does that work? Yeah. So we have a fund that we're raising capital. We're raising about $10 million in our fund. It's about a $30 million portfolio. It's probably going to go a little bit higher than that, just with the actual activity and the amount of investors that are interested. So our portfolio is going to probably be about $80, $90 million fund. Got it. And is it accredited only investors or are you doing a 506B? No, accredited only 506C. Got it. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I prefer that. Yeah, it's cleaner. Sometimes you deal with people that are, they can obviously 506C, if you're accredited, the theory is make enough money or have enough money to take a hit if there is a negative impact on a deal or, or something like that. So, and then are you thought about branching on other assets or you're just really kind of being the mobile home park guy? Yeah, just a mobile home park guy. I mean, I did the other stuff like we mentioned, but I don't see myself actually deviating from this. I like the cash. I like providing houses for residents, good, clean, quality houses. It feels good. I like this space. And I guess the profile of the returns is if you think about a development deal, it is all appreciation. You're not getting any cash flow, right? You think about a debt fund, it's all cash flow, zero appreciation. And how does this one fit in? Is it kind of a hybrid where you get if an investor comes in, they're going to get cash flow because obviously you're buying deals that are cash flowing. And also, do these mobile home parks appreciate significantly or what's the exit strategy, I guess? Yeah. So the cash flow from day one, that's what we actually look for. That's one. Two is that, yes, we actually split the cash flow, the appreciation. And when we sell with our investors 50 50, and we give them a 10% preferred return as well mm. on the capital. And we're just being very generous because there's actually enough meat on the bone to actually make things work. When you actually raise rents on a park, let's just say you have a 50 space park and you raise the rents $25 a month, right? Per each space times 12. You do that for three years, the value is worth a million dollars. Yeah. You increase the value about a million dollars. So I like that part as well. So not only did you increase the cash flow, you actually increased the appreciation. Yeah. I mean, that's like you said earlier, the benefit of commercial real estate is it's based on it's a business, right? So you value it based on the operations of the business, not necessarily what your next door neighbor sold their property for a month or six months earlier. So yeah, makes sense. I appreciate all the time. And this has been some fascinating stories. Maybe we'll have you back on and we'll just chat about some of the funny things that you've run into with your direct seller stuff. I did a little bit of that in 2019, I think it was. We were looking at smaller mobile home parks and we actually got a hit on like an eight unit or something like that. It was very interesting to say the least. (laughs) (laughs) So maybe that's for another time. But I'm going to transition to the final three pack of questions I ask every guest. First question is, what's one piece of advice that got you started or helped you along your real estate journey? Not listening to anyone else. That's actually a good one. If if someone wants to just like, hey, I just want to be big in apartment buildings or single family homes or land, just go for it. And yeah, listen to the naysayers. You're actually always going to have that. Yeah, no matter what you search for, you'll find a for and against argument online. So it doesn't matter what it is. Absolutely. It's it's normal. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. What is your favorite real estate or business book that you're into right now? Oh, business book driven by Larry H. Miller. I mean, he came from poor kid and he created, I think, 150 car dealerships. He owned the Utah Jazz cash. He owned the stadium cash free and clear. He owned movie theaters. I mean, he was just, he did extremely well and had a huge family that loved him. That's a really good book that I would recommend. Very cool. I have not heard of that. I will check it out for sure. All right. Final question is, if you hit your financial freedom number, meaning you could live an amazing life just off of the passive income from your investments, what would you do? be honest with you, I actually would continue to do the same thing I'm doing. So I think I'm semi-retired when I was 20-something years old. And I've kind of retired during COVID is because I was making a ton of money off this mobile home park and there was nothing to do. I mean, you could go outside. Arizona wasn't as closed down as other states, but I was literally bored. So I'd rather actually have the stress of buying parks than being bored. (laughs) No, it's fair. And you're helping yourself, you're helping your investors, and you're helping the sellers all at the same time. So And the tenants. So awesome. Well, Walter, if people want to get in touch with you, learn more about mobile home parks or think of talking about your fund, like what's the best way to get you? Yeah. So Walter Johnson, and you can reach out to me in my office, 480-674-2035. 
or Walter at Sonos Capital, S-O-N-O-S Capital.com. Cool. Awesome. Well, Walter, best of luck. Appreciate the time and we'll talk again soon. All right. That works. Thanks for having me on. Yep. I hope you got value out of this episode of the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. Your one-stop shop for education on how you can continue to work hard in your career and have different options to invest even harder. If you took anything away from this episode, please like and comment. I read every comment as it helps me serve you better. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you won't miss out on more valuable content. If you're watching this video, it means that you want to grow your passive real estate portfolio. The easiest way to do that is to join our investor club by heading to greatventurecapital.com slash invest. The link is in the show notes. See you on the next episode.